language of the new blockchain-based financial markets. Can you speak it? Subscribe to Tokenize and let's find out together. So I'll let you give the big announcement. I know a lot of guys in the media are waiting for it this morning. <laughs> right, right. Well, thank you for that. So, so yeah, we've been talking about uh, payments and cross-border payments uh, in the IBM blockchain space for, for kind of a long time now. And uh, today is the day that we announced that IBM is open for business and payments uh, with WorldWire. It is a new type of uh, payment network uh, built for regulated financial institutions, both banks and non-banks. It allows them to to come together to discover each other's capabilities, to trust each other, and to transact uh, in real time. It's a, it's a new payment network like no other, and we're launching it today uh, in 72 countries, support for 47 currencies, and 44 banking endpoints with pay-in and pay-out locations all over the world. So it's a major milestone for, uh, for IBM. That's very cool. And that, obviously the backbone of it, you guys are using Stellar Protocol, right? Yes, that's right. And the big element here, Jeff, I mean, from, there's obviously the IBM guys who have used a number of blockchains out there, not, not the Bitcoins and Ethereum, but I mean the ones that are more payment focused. Uh, you don't think about Dash, and uh, Ripple, and even the, now uh, Stellar. What do you think Stellar is a better platform for what IBM wants to do? Yeah, I, I mean, there, so there are a lot of like uh, blockchain protocols and platforms out there in the world. Most of them, it all kind of gets lumped into one bucket, but but really they're all kind of serving different purposes. You know, like Bitcoin is, is a very different thing than what Stellar is, and, and Ethereum is also, like you, like you mentioned. Stellar is really one of the very few that's built specifically for payments and cross-border payments. Like it allows you to hold any kind of asset into the network, has a built-in exchange that lets you swap, you know, asset A for asset B. And uh, all these things are needed if you actually want to have a payment network that plugs in with the existing infrastructure that is in the world today. If you if you if you don't think that you could just like bypass that stuff completely and go to, go to a whole new thing, then you need a, a way to like onboard the existing fiat currencies that people are used to using, and that's what Stellar does. So, yeah. So, that, and I guess for you guys, that was a, the best choice from that perspective as well. Right? Yeah, I mean, we, we looked at a lot, um, uh, but but scalability of the network, the ability to support you know many concurrent transactions, thousands of transactions per second, was kind of the entry point. You know, if this is going to be used uh, commercial grade, and then. The ease by which you can um, register new assets, you know, representations of, of new assets. One of the one of the things about WorldWire that makes it unique is our focus on creating an ecosystem of, of digital assets that financial institutions can use um, to settle transactions in real time. I mean, that's really kind of the, the novelty of all of this is the payment data um, and the value, the store of value moved together, and that just wasn't possible, you know, ten years ago. But just so not to be devil's advocate, but you know, some people, for a lot of the banks in the room, this is good news, right? But, you know, in the early days of crypto, we all had this dream that crypto was going to enable financial inclusion, really the unbanked, you know, uh, poor farmer in the middle of India. With this action, you're just helping banks or money transmitters make it faster and cheaper. And maybe it's not really helping financial inclusion. What do you guys think of that? Do you think it's going to have a positive impact? I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's going to have a, a major impact. So uh, that's one of the focus areas for us. Um, if you think there's, what, 2 billion or so, that's the number that's always used, 2 billion adults around the world that don't have access to financial services, that don't have a bank account, um, and yet over a billion of those people, it's estimated, actually have a smartphone or a feature phone that's actually capable of storing digital value. That's the whole point. I mean, we can actually bring money further and farther than it could ever go before, even if there's not you know, a tangible banking presence in some of these emerging economies. So that's, you know, that's the, and that's what's making the payments industry grow. It's not just taking rev uh, revenue or market share away from somebody else, some of the incumbents. There's actually new business being born because there's two billion people in the world um, that can now be part of this global financial economy. So actually, on, on the global financial economy, one of the big themes we're discussing right now in the crypto world globally is stable coins. Uh, actually, with world, worldwide right now, from what I understand, you can actually use uh, stable coins, but also lumens, uh, but stable coins as well. I'll bring it to you, Jed. I mean, from your perspective, what is the impact you believe stable coins will have when it comes to crypto adoption more broadly? Yeah, I mean, uh, so I prefer the term like fiat token. I mean, stable coin is, you know, <laughs> what's stable? Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> like, are these things stable? But, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, this was kind of always our thesis from the very beginning is that you need some sort of on-ramp from the existing currencies that people are used to. It, it, rather than say like, hey, adopt this new token that you've never even heard of. Here's, this is the digital dollar. This is the digital euro. This is something that you're used to. It's just a digital form. And that, that's the way that you get people to, to like basically uh, 
like upgrade from the old financial network to the new one is you give them this upgrade path. And so now they have the same stuff that they're used to, but it's just in a much, um, a much better form that's like quicker to move around. It's like there's way less friction. It's, you can send to literally everyone in the world rather than just you know uh, people under confined to your same network, right? So uh, I think I think these like fiat tokens are essential to actually uh, creating like worldwide adoption for these kind of technology. Because so that was one of the drivers behind uh, empowering stable tokens on the platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're focused on uh, an, an ecosystem of digital assets, you know, that represent real world value that participants on the network can to, can dynamically kind of choose and negotiate amongst each other what's the best settlement instrument you know they want to use. Uh, I'm still bullish about you know cryptos being a viable settlement instrument in the future. I, I you know I, I mean if. 1200 BC, you know, we were using cowrie shells to uh, to transact. I mean, th there's no reason that we can't. But but it's really exciting to see. We also have um, six banks who have signed letters of intent with uh, with IBM to issue their own stable coins. Sorry, but you know, their, <laughs> their own their own fiat tokens yeah. in five different uh, currencies. I mean, the Indonesian rupiah, a Philippine peso. Uh, Brazilian real, Korean won. I mean, and the list is just going to grow. And just to imagine what that does um, to just the FX market as more and more liquidity starts to come on, the market, um, it's it's profound to think about. We focus a lot on the, the, the role of these fiat tokens or crypto in emerging markets. Yeah, I mean, our, our, our thinking is that you know payments work okay in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, you know, there's some friction, but it's not it's not uh, really life affecting. Whereas in like places like Nigeria, you know, 60% of people don't even have bank accounts. They depend really heavily on remittances, and it's there that's just where there's the most. It'll just be much the way like mobile phone adoption you know, took off way quicker where there wasn't already landlines, right? So it'll be a similar phenomenon. I think, so. What do you guys think of the, the financial institutions launching uh, their own stable co stable coins like the JPM most recently? Yeah. Yeah, well, from my perspective, um, JPM coin is was great validation for the vision that we had, you know, originally thought about for Worldwide Again because we we believe it's it's about choices, right, in terms of the instruments that you want to use to sell. Um, I think JPM coin has a long way to go, but the fact that they're you know they've got the bravado to announce in, in advance, um, it's more of a of a walled garden, you know, um, it's kind of to help connect their franchise and their subsidiaries internally. Uh, but longer term, I think it would be great to have you know JPM coin on on Worldwide. Uh, and I believe there'll be interoper interoperability between other stable coins and the Worldwire you guys are built. Yeah, in fact, so really Worldwire is designed to be um, you know kind of an open uh, open garden. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, an open garden that would allow um, fungibility of these uh, financial institution issued tokens across institutions. You know, and that's that's going to be really important as well. So what's the message? Obviously in the room we have a lot of executives from financial institutions and remittance companies. If you had one message for them, what would it be? Well, I mean, I'll start. So, so with Worldwire, um, you know, we built this network to four financial institutions. So they shouldn't be afraid. You're not coming. Uh... No, in fact, the, the, the beauty of this is we provide a consistent way for financial institutions to come together, to, to interact with each other, to transact with each other. And there's no cost to join the network. It's, it's free, right? You can join the network for free. We're inviting all sorts of regulated financial institutions to join. I think it provides an exciting sort of equalizer across financial services companies around the world. You only pay for what you use, and IBM's interest is not to be you know, a market maker or not to become a bank. You just want to be the network operator. Continue to do good at what we're really good at for the last 108 years is you know building <laughs> scalable business systems around the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just say like I mean people will always ask like what is Stellar's competition and really there, there's very little. Like what we are actually trying to do is make this common standard right that anyone can adopt and we hope everyone adopts because then everyone then their payments become interoperable with someone else's payments right so. Uh, and that's just better for everyone. It reduces a lot of friction and, and makes it where your users can now send to all over the world and they can receive from all over the world, which is a, a much better uh, situation than what we currently have. And really, it should just be a win for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So. But what is the biggest challenge you're seeing? I mean, you know, obviously, we all deal with financial institutions that are trying to embrace crypto. What is the biggest challenge if anybody in the room wants to get more involved in this space? What are the biggest challenges you think they're having? What do you think they'll have? Uh, I, I mean, you know, Maybe I'm too close to it, but for me it seems like very simple. Like you just adopt this new standard. You you know maybe you work with someone like Worldwire or someone else that that's kind of doing the same sort of thing, and then 
uh, and now can like send to other people on the network, right? It's 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 more just the will to do it, really, than anything else. So. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think the biggest barrier is sort of the the, the fear the fear the fear of change. Uh, we, you know, we've got investment in you know global financial systems infrastructure that really hasn't changed for you know 50 years or more and you know it's like if it's not broke don't fix it kind of a thing but there really is you know i always say there's no there's no amount of incremental improvement to the propeller that gets you to the jet engine and, you know the jet engine is now here so you know let's get on board and, and go further faster what's really exciting guys in the industry in the broader crypto markets well, well, for me, it's it's uh, seeing the, the the banks, you know, come along. I, I'm relatively new to IBM. I've only been at IBM two years. Before that, I worked for a little small bank in uh, San Francisco with a stagecoach out front for 20 years, and it's great to see um, it's great to see the progress and the mentality of the executives in banking who are you know, kind of steering the establishment, starting to realize the benefits going from. You know, Bitcoin is a scam to, well, maybe there's some value in this blockchain thing to, you know, and within a short period of 18 months to, hey, we're going to issue our own stable coin. Uh, I, I think that momentum, the mind share, the momentum of the, of the mentality is, is really exciting. It's very exciting as well. Yeah, Sing that as well. Yeah, I mean, for me, uh, I agree. Like, I, I feel like uh, although we've just gone through this like kind of crypto winter, I think uh, the real projects are, are still around and, and people are still excited about things. This whole like the stable coin phenomenon actually is a, a huge validation of what Stellar's mission has been the whole time and like our head model. So I'm pretty excited about that. I'm obviously very excited about projects like Worldwire and there's a lot of other things that are going on in the ecosystem as well. So. Alice, I have no idea what they're about. I want answers that are one or two words, quick answer, and like five second answers. And if you go along, my best friend, the bell, will be here to interrupt you. First question, <laughs> I'll start from you, Jesse. If you could go back to university today, what is the one course you would take, you wish you had taken if when you were young? Economics. Why is that? Because it's all about economics. Jen? Uh, same question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would probably take more physics. Phys <laughs> what is that? It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, we'll start from you, Jen. <laughs> Tomorrow you have a chance to start a new crypto startup. You have the choice between these co-founders, none of them crypto. Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Ma, Elon Musk, or my Armenian compatriot, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Which one do you choose? Uh, Jack Ma. Why is that? He seems like the most capable. <laughs> <laughs> Not even Kim Kardashian? <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take Kim, yeah. She, she, she's just golden. Every time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next question. Your nephew comes and tells you he has a couple of job offers. One from a large bank, one from a startup, one from a big four consulting firm, and one with the government. What job you recommend he takes, Jesse? I'd go to the bank, actually. Uh, and, and being from a bank, again, I'm seeing the tide change, and I'm seeing banks want to be more innovative. Startup, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> beta, especially if you're young. Okay, we'll start from you this one. Oh, this is perfect. Donald Trump calls you tomorrow, and he tells you he wants to make, he wants you to be his crypto advisor to make America a great crypto nation again. What is the one piece of advice you have for him on crypto? Uh, just get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesse, yeah, my answer would be, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, well, okay, next one. If today you're the CEO of a traditional legacy payment company or a CEO of a bank, many of them in the room, what is the one, the one thing you would do, the most important thing you would do, if you're the CEO of a bank or payment company? Uh, I would be um, preparing now for, um, you know, kind of the advent of crypto like we prepared for Y2K, you know, in one of your two. Yeah, I, I would just uh, take a good lesson from Amazon and Barnes & Noble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last question, and we finish it off with this, we have 30 seconds. I'll start from you, Jim. If you're not doing the job you're doing today, what job would you be doing? To not be crypto related. Sure, I'd probably be working AI. AI. That's cool. I see. I, I would be a professional surfer. <laughs> I've seen some, you know, some recent buzz on on social about, uh, oh, you know, institutional involvement in Bitcoin. It's a bad thing because then it's, you know, not broadly, you know, held. It's held, you know, the big chunks of it are held by, you know, the money supply are held by small. But you know, we forget that, you know, we look at the U.S. dollar that's divisible into, you know, 100 units called a penny. 
but you know, bitcoins are divisible into million of units, right? And so I'm not so worried about that. And I think you know, institutional adoption is, is what brings the the credibility to bring uh, more confidence in it to use it uh, for you know for things like you know store of value and and means of exchange and and all these things that constitute the the true attributes of of money. And so I, I think. I think it's great, actually. I don't think it's a bad thing that yeah. institutions are getting involved. And you, you think it's the adoption it's going to have, that uh, institutional investors will have a positive impact, or it's going to be retail grassroots adoption that will drive it to the next level? Um, on the investment side, I mean, I think, I think, I think it takes both. Uh, you know, I mean, you really, to make these things useful, like one of the other things that's really holding us back is like liquidity. Like it's really hard, or not hard, but, it, but the liquidity is just not there in a lot of, between a lot of corridors, and it's really going to take institutional investors to like provide that, so. Yeah. Okay, so talk about institutional investors and institutional players in the market. Let's talk about Worldwire, the announcement you guys made this morning. Can you just maybe summarize for the audience in a minute what exactly the announcements you guys had this morning and what is the practical impact for the people working in the room uh, on, on the financial services? Right, right. So, so um, Worldwire uh, is a new type of payment network um, based on blockchain technology. It's designed for um, regulated financial institutions that includes both banks um, and non-banks, so you know, regulated money transfer operators. The idea is that we could convene this network that, by the way, is free for financial institutions to join. Um, IBM serves this role as a as a network operator to allow uh, financial institutions, smaller, uh, you know, regional um, players, to come together to expand their geographic reach to transact in real time. Uh, but the real novelty of the system, which is, I think, uh, a, a, a derivative of the Stellar uh, protocol that we're using is the ability um, for payment data, uh, you know, messaging and, and uh, uh, customer information, you know, all the KYC information that needs to happen and the store of value to move together on a single network. And that, that just doesn't happen in, in today's, you know, financial services um, or you know, correspondent banking. So it's a radical transformation of the way money flows to make it more um, synergistic with the way the internet works. You know, it's kind of like, it's about time. You know, money should move this way and it should have a long time ago. So if I get it right, so it's a permission network. So yep. everybody, all the players or the banks that come to the network obviously have to be vetted by the... By the, by the right, by IBM. Yeah, essentially, right? Yep. And the medium of exchange they're going to use is, is going to be either Lumens or stable coins, right? Y yes. And financial institutions that come on board can issue their own stable coins. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, so uh, out of the gate, you know, we're open for business now. That's that's the essence of the announcement. Um, we support uh, Lumens as a you know as a bridge asset, uh, which is the you know kind of the native asset of, of, of the Stellar protocol and and uh, a U.S. dollar uh, stable coin. But we've got commitments from six banks around the world and five other currencies, and we just that, that are going to issue their own stable coins. Uh, and, and these and, currencies are emerging markets, right? You mentioned they are. They are so um, so Philippine peso, Indonesian rupiah, uh, Brazilian real, uh, Korean won. Uh, th those are uh, those are the the four. Um, in addition to the U.S. dollar, we have a euro one that's that's on the way too. And, and the, the momentum is just building. It's 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 just going to be. Um, I, I think it won't be long before we have you know coverage in terms of endpoints all over the entire world. I mean, just the momentum is happening that fast, and then we'll, we'll continue to get you know digital assets that represent you know, fiat backed tokens. Um, you know, from pretty much all the major currencies. Actually, Jen, on this point, right? So the big obviously there's a lot of enthusiasm on stable coins. We discussed it this morning. Technically, on this platform, I could use Lumens. I could use, you know, the Stellar coin if you want, or I could use stable coins. What do you think is our, are the advantages actually for people to use Lumens? And you believe as we get more and more stable coins, we have still have a need for it. Right. So, so basically, you're not using really one or the other. Like if, if you're say in Mexico, you're going to want to use a peso locally, but yep. when you want to send it, you're you're converting to something else, right? And so the, the the question is like, what do you use as the bridge currency between your pesos and say uh, Riai or something yep. like that, right? And and you can yep. either you, you so Lumens are a very natural choice just because there's no counterparty, right? And so it's it's very easy to go between one and the other thing. You don't want to have like uh, an exchange between each 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 pair of currencies. You don't want like pesos to Riai, pesos right. to yeah, pesos to like all these different currencies in the world because it's just you would just lack liquidity, right? So you need some like 
currency in the middle that you just have one exchange to, and then you have like order n rather than order n squared, different combinations. And that's the rule that Lumens are playing. That's where that's where Lumens fit in. It's kind of the bridge between all these different other like stable coins. So, so who do you keep, I mean, obviously the winners on these will be clients who can now use the platform. It's cheaper. It's faster. It's more efficient. Who do you think the loser is going to be with such developments? I mean, there's obviously worldwide, but there'll be you know, hopefully many others as well. Okay. Who do you think are? Is it Swift? Is it uh, correspondent banking? Is it? Yeah. So from an IBM perspective, we're you know uh, we're not discriminating against any one participant. I mean, there's an open invitation to come join the network. We have some minimum criteria. I mean, you have to be a regulated financial institution yeah. in good standing with your regulator in the jurisdictions in which you operate. But um, so I think the only losers are going to be the ones that choose not to play, right? I mean, because I I just think the the momentum is already you know going right the train is already leaving the station and yeah. um, you can choose to just not get on um, which would be kind of silly because there's no you know there's no downside for not getting on right so um, yeah so I, I think the only losers are going to be uh, the ones who decide not to mm -hmm. not to play but I mean it's clear like all these initiatives we have are clearly disrupting the status quo. I mean, let's let's face it, right? It, it, it's disrupting the status quo, but there's but it's easy for instance like for Swift or these other payment yeah. networks to just plug in, and it just gives them further reach. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of financial institutions that Swift doesn't pay out to, and this yep. allows them to pay out to those. So, so some of, uh, we've got a number of, a lot of questions coming in. Keep keep them going. One of them is actually on what about Facebook? If these technology players want to come in and join the, the platform, they're not regulated financial institutions. Would they be able to do so? Well, well, Facebook actually is, but yeah, so yeah, they could. Yeah, I mean, they have like money transmitter licenses, and to the extent that they want to be, do like money transmission connected to this network, they could. Yeah. So they they will be able to come and join as well. So it's not only financial institutions or money uh, offer. Yeah, yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't turn Facebook and their two point six billion yeah. users away. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> We'd be happy to work with them. So another question here we have is what about for adoption? Right? What do you guys think will be the catalyst for adoption? What would be the big moment that we'll have that will have like the internet moment that we had that people started coming on board. Like, that's fast and it's fast. Right. So, so it, it, I don't know that there will be one single thing. I mean, really what, what I think has been holding things back for the last you know, eight years, ever since like cryptocurrency has been a thing, is that there hasn't been a network, right? And, and one of the things that makes me very excited about this is that Worldwire is just bringing a network together like by bringing all these people to the table at one time, which I think is a key. And once they're all at the table, then each additional person is just that much easier, and eventually it has a momentum of its own, and that's when it just kind of go, ramps up and grows organically. What do you think when it comes to apps and even B2C uh, offering? That we always give the example, if my mom wants to buy Bitcoin, now it's getting better, but you know, right. for other usage of it, we're not there yet. I mean, do you think that's one of the issues we have? Yeah, yeah I, I do. I mean, I think... Like anything, you know, the, the internet, if you can remember that far back, I'm, I'm dating myself, but you know, when the, when the internet kind of came online, you're like, what, you know, what is this thing? What, 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 is, a, what is Mosaic? What is a web browser? Why, why do I need it? But, but as applications started to build on top of that, you know, and the killer app was, was email back in the day, we, we, we need that, that moment, that killer app moment. So as applications begin to be deployed, especially I think for consumers, like you say, for your mom, for the, app, for the average person that, that, can, that can get an app and say, okay, now I can transfer money and I can, I can send money to my friend um, from the US and the UK and I don't have to worry about, I'm sending dollars and what pops up is, is pound, British pound, pound sterling yep. on their side and the, and the FX and the conversion just happens somewhere in between, like that's how it's supposed to work. And so well, I think we're getting to the point where we've laid the foundation now for the infrastructure for the network, as Jet said, and now the applications can start happening. And there's tons of investment. Um, happening like in, in Silicon Valley and places around the world Absolutely. into the application space. Just times. Seller Protocol supports smart contracts. Does Worldwire also support this smart contract? I'll let you maybe uh, get one with this. Uh, well, uh, maybe you can speak more to or, it. Well, it yeah, supports. so I mean, um, Worldwire doesn't uh, really support uh, smart contracts yeah. in, in, in the traditional sense, and, and Jed can probably talk um, a little bit more about you know um, the differences between the Stellar Protocol and say something like you know like Ethereum. But um, you know we chose the Stellar Protocol because it was so fine tuned for payments um, for the registration of digital assets. I mean it's so easy to create. A digital asset that you don't even need something like ERC20, right? ERC20 was invented really on the back of a napkin, you know, somewhere probably. I mean, it's not a very sophisticated yep. interface, but it was invented because the, you know, kind of the base Ethereum, you know, protocol um, 
was trying to be general purpose. Well, well you know, Stellar and the Stellar Protocol is very specific um, to that purpose. So yeah, so smart contracts are not really part of the solution. Uh, From a use case perspective as yeah. well, what are you guys trying to achieve? It's not, right. uh, yeah, it's just, it adds to too much complexity. We don't, we don't really need it, yeah. Okay, um, another one on interoperability, right? With like other uh, blockchains like Ethereum, EOS, what are the plans on that one? If any. Um, for, for Worldwide or for Stellar? I mean, let's start with Stellar and obviously it's linked to that, right? So, so on the Stellar side of things, I mean, we're, we're working on sort of our, our lightning-like uh, payment channels right now that will eventually be interoperable with other networks. Um, the interoperability piece is, is not a huge initiative for us. Uh, I, I think usually that interoperability can come just from the way Stellar works natively, where people like to put a Bitcoin token on the Stellar or put a Ethereum token on the Stellar and then that can yeah. interact with the network. Um, or, or through exchanges. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sold on this idea where things actually need to interlock seamlessly between networks as being that important. But. And you, you don't think if we, if we don't have proper interoperability, we'll have a kind of gardens that are not talking to each other directly? And that well, well, so most of these protocols serve different functions, right? Yeah. It's, it's uh, you know, like Ethereum is this kind of world distributed computer, Bitcoin is like kind of this digital gold, and, and others are even more specific than those things. And, do they really need to interact with uh, like a global payment network? Maybe, but, but probably not, right? So, um, so yeah. So, the, and to the extent that they do, you can already kind of do that by just by tokenizing them and putting yeah. them on Stellar in the first place. So, yeah. what do you think, Jesse? I mean, technically, if I'm issuing my own stable coin, should I be able to use the Worldwide Network with my? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. And and to talk to the interoperability thing, I mean, I think obviously leave it to. The, the smart people in, in, in Stellar and, and the, the Stellar core developers to figure out what interoperability with other chains looks like. But um, from our perspective, you know, we're going to be led by market demand for you know these tokens. And so, if there's you know an ERC twenty token that's that's out there that people really want, Stellar provides a really easy way for us to represent that in a tokenized fashion. You know, on the World Wire network. Right? I mean, you know, you just provide an anchor for that thing, and, and off you go. And so, again, I see that as um, a, a really great bridge to connecting to other assets that are issued in other places. Um, but you know, it sort of begs the question: Well, then, why issue it in another place? Why not just issue it right here? So. And do you expect one question we have is on Asia? Do you expect Asia and emerging markets to see where is the biggest demand for this? Right now, it is the biggest demand. I mean, if you look, you know, we're, we're now 72 countries, um, you, you know, 47 currencies. Most of them are, uh, are Europe and Asia focused. Um, yeah. And, you know, the U.S. market will come later. There's a lot more, you know, regulatory considerations in the U.S. that we want to work through and make sure we get right. But yet we're focusing on, on this side of the world to begin with. Yeah. There's definitely I think, a use case from that perspective. Actually, let's yeah. talk about regulations. You mentioned... Uh, you know, I'm a lawyer by background. I actually find regulation sexy and exciting. Uh -huh. But when it comes to crypto uh, adoption and um, you know, bring it to a 2.0, what do you guys think is the impact of regulation? Is it a positive, a negative? It's a you gotta deal with it. Well, let's start, let's start with, with you, Jed. I mean, what do you think of regulations? You know, somebody coming in looking from outside. Yeah, I mean, uh, like our our experience has actually been pretty positive when we've talked to regulators all over the world. I mean, most people take a pretty like cautiously optimistic view of this. They, you know. They understand it's new. They understand that it has a lot of promise for, for their citizens, right? So they, they actually have been have been pretty supportive of it. Um, and I, I, you know, so I'm I'm actually usually what we're doing actually is novel technically, but but it is still just at the end of the day you're moving money and it, it fits under the existing regulations, right? It fits under mm -hmm. like you're moving money from person A to person B, like do the normal regulatory things. And it doesn't really change the regulatory requirements or put you into some new like regime, like it, you know. That's what we're finding anyway. So. And because even on worldwide, there'll be KYC, but we all regulated financial institutions. So, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, that, that's the minimum criteria to join. Right. It's yeah. not like we're trying to you know blow all of that away. But I but I do think uh, regulation is inevitable. Um, but but I think you know inherently the the subject matter that we're talking about, you know, distributed networks um, and autonomy and transparency and those kinds of things are going to force. Um, the, the regulators to focus on things where we really need them to focus on, which is like asset classification. You yeah. Know, what are these types of different assets that are on here? Because what's happening is we're seeing, you know, different asset classes able to come together and to be able to be swapped dynamically. You know, again, that's the vision I think behind 
behind Stellar, and that opens up whole new doors across uh, banking, capital markets, uh, everywhere. So I think the regulator's role is to really dig in and, and start looking at you know these asset classes. We say cryptocurrencies. There's really not 1,200 cryptocurrencies. A lot of them are you know securities. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it should coins too. Right? Yeah, but but you, you know what I mean. There needs to be better. Uh, yeah. so what about central bank backed cryptocurrencies? Right. I mean, a lot of people would say that whenever we have central bank comes in and issues its own cryptocurrency, it's a great risk-free asset. We may see actually central bank backed cryptocurrencies may actually destroy the rest of the ecosystem. Because that's what we see the option. What do you guys think of that? Of central banks issuing their own coins and potentially using worldwide. So, so in my view, it's a natural evolution, and I think that's what central banks should be doing. I mean, it's their actual function is to issue currency, right? And now currency is moving away from paper form into this digital form, and yep. they should be the ones backing these tokens and these networks rather than some other bank. But you know, to the you know, it's going to take time for them to start doing this, and some will move faster than others. But you know, it's a total natural positive development as far as I'm concerned. And just you think one day we'll have on Worldwire a central bank back cryptocurrency? I, 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 I guarantee it. Yeah, it's going to happen. <laughs> no, I think that's really the big, uh, the big thing to go. Let's, the question is when, huh? That's a big one. How, how about we just go with very, very soon? Yeah. <laughs> that's excellent. Well, looking forward to that. Actually, we have a lot of questions on the platform, actually, and assets we can actually put on. Uh, there's a couple of them on... Uh, let's talk about security tokens on worldwide. Let's talk actually with Stellar and we we'll link up to worldwide. If we have real estate backed tokens or security tokens more broadly, can we use those on Stellar and then move it to worldwide? Yeah, absolutely. You, uh, Stellar is agnostic to what you're tokenizing. You can put any kind of token on there. It could be real estate, some security thing. It could be goats. Someone did that early on in Stellar. Goats. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can literally put anything. It, 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 it's actually, that's what it was designed to do. And that's what Jesse was hinting at originally is that. It doesn't require this like complicated smart contra contracting technique like code. It's just primitive to the actual network, so it's very simple to, to represent anything on there. And, and it gives kind of the fine grained controls that you need for a security and things like that. So you can like do the things that regulators will want you to do. Like yeah, you can have more control over who's holding your token. Things and like that's that. the beauty of your platform. Right? You have that flexibility yeah. of whatever you want to put in. On Worldwire, though, obviously you guys don't want to like. It, it could technically one day we see uh, asset back tokens on it. I mean, we have obviously stable coins. But the real estate back projects? Well, I mean, technically, we could. Uh, and by the way, I, I hear there's a there's a Jed McCaleb hug token out sure. there. Oh, sure. there. There's a whole lot, and I think they're they're going up in value because there's a lot of people that are going to cash them in here. Next week, but, um, but yeah, there's there's no reason there's no technical reason why. Yeah, Worldwire is focused on this low hanging fruit. You know, from the standpoint of IBM blockchain being the leader in in. In this blockchain space, we're looking at okay, in financial services, um, cross-border payments is this you know this area that's just ripe for for transformation, and so we're focused on currencies and FX and you know kind of bringing optimization there first. But there's no technical reason why you couldn't have you know cars and home, real you know real estate, real property, uh, oh, securities. Yeah. yeah, I mean there's the, there's the, there's no limit. Exactly. You guys, it's a low hanging fruit right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From there. Yeah. Other questions here going on. Um, one of them we have here is on um, um, you know, uh, uh, Swift. You know, the question is, do you guys see Swift as a competitor or a potential partner? I mean, you answered a bit before. What do you guys think? I mean, if you're the CEO today of Swift, what do you guys do? Jump on board, try to do the same thing, copy it, partner, avoid it? Been doing what the, ta the tax industry has done with the Ubers. Right. I mean, in my mind, like what we're offering is this very good, like open protocol that anyone can use. It's just a payment format, and I would like to see like the likes of Swift adopted. Obviously, right? So, um, whether they're going to do that or not is an open question. But but it, it makes sense to me. It's like like Jesse said. There's no there's no downside to doing it. It's just it's yeah. an open standard that you can adopt, and it's not within Swift. It would be Swift to the rest of the world. So it doesn't even change what they're doing now. Yeah. It just allows them to serve more people. So it seems like. Yeah. So a couple questions actually on the the platform itself. I mean, a lot of questions like why not Bitcoin and, and the speed. I mean, let's focus on the compared to other networks you have. Can you share with us more what is a transaction speed per second and scalability that you have with Stellar and Worldwire basically? For the audience to understand. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, one of the reasons that we you know, chose the Stellar protocol is um, for its for its scalability. So, you know, and this these are these are attributes or properties that are inherent to 
to Stellar, right? Not just to WorldWire. So we get this by default. But I mean, transaction times, commit times, anywhere between, you know, like three to 30 seconds. Um, you know, we add a little bit more because there's messaging that we built on top of that, right? So there has to be you no know, acknowledgement of messages because there's KYC stuff happening between the, the transacting counterparties in the background. But, you know, we've already seen, you know, measurable throughput in some of our load testing of thousands of transactions per second. Yeah. And, and again, that's just the beginning. From my perspective, there's been no real meaningful focus yet on optimizing performance. I mean, that, that will come. I and mean, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at actually building and convening this network. So I have no doubt in my mind that when the smart people then turn their focus and say, okay, we got to go from a thousand transactions to sec per second to a million, that, that'll just happen. That'll just yeah. come. Yeah. What is the worldwide? Worldwide will be open to any participant who wants to come on board. Yeah. Yeah. Subject to the, you know the criteria, you have to be a regulated financial yeah. institution in good standing with your regulator. Um, you could you know you can apply to, to come on the Worldwire network. I like to think of Worldwire as sort of a, a commercial layer on top of this open source you know Stellar um, protocol. Um, yeah. We are um, and we're leveraging. Um, the scale of IBM's relationships with financial services around the world, like Jed said, to kind of bring participants to the network in the form of, of both market makers, you know, these these um, entities to provide the, the last mile, you know, pay in and pay out locations, do the conversion between fiat currency and, and digital assets, really, which is what enables real-time FX, right? And so, um, so, you know, IBM is, our long game is to be the network operator, right? So um, we, we do due diligence um, and we do governance on the participants on the network. We maintain the infrastructure. We maintain the API, which is a simplified, you know, payment-centric um, uh, version of, you know, the lower level um, Stellar Horizon um, API and, and protocol. And, you know, we bring messaging, payment messaging, standards-based payment messaging to the, the platform as, as well. So, um, and we're using Swift, right? I mean, we're using I wanna, the, yeah, I, the ISO 2022 message format, right? So again, it's all about the novelty is the, the payment data and, and the value in all sorts of different forms that participants can choose move together uh, in real time on the network. So all of that you know, movement and capabilities provided by Stellar, and we're trying to add this, this commercial value add on top and just make it open for anyone to join. My best friend, The Bell, is back with us for a night of uh, fire out, uh, fireside uh, round of questions. Again, guys, so these are questions you have no idea what it is about. Uh, answers, quick couple of words or less than five seconds. If not, my best friend, The Bell, will stop you guys. <laughs> we'll start from you, Jesse. The, the many people in the room want to learn more, more about crypto, keep on top of the latest developments. If there's one book, one news publication, or influencer you recommend they should follow, who, who or what would it be? Chad McCaleb. Chad McCaleb. <laughs> Yeah, uh, definitely not me. I don't publish that much. So uh, yeah, uh, let's see. The publication you like, or one book they should. Yeah. Um, I would just read the original Bitcoin paper. I think. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The October thirty first. Yeah. I'll start with you, Jed. This is an interesting one. Quadriga. If you had the chance to have a couple words with the now, unfortunately, passed away founder, what would it be? What would you tell him? Uh, well, I don't really know what happened there. Like, is he dead? Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but Jesse, you've got a couple words with uh, with uh, with the ex CEO of uh, Quadriga, the exchange in Canada. What would it be? Right. Don't write your keys down on Post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, uh, we'll start from you. This one. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Jesse. We'll start from you. There's a lot of talks about central bank backed cryptocurrencies. If you're a betting man, what is the first G20 country you think will issue a central bank backed cryptocurrency? Well, wow, that's scary. I'll get in trouble by my corporate consult. Let me just say somewhere on this Region. side of the world. Asia, <laughs> Asia country. Okay, Jed. Uh, I have less insight than Jesse, but uh, I don't know. Singapore. <laughs> there you go. Good, good, good way to the host here. They love it. And uh, my last question, we'll finish with this one. You have the, the chance to launch your next crypto startup. You have a choice between these co-founders. Crypto, which one you think, which one you take? Vitalik Buterin? Charlie Lee from Litecoin, Craig Wright, or Nuriel Rubini, Dr. Doom. <laughs> Jesse, we'll oh, start with you. How come Jet's not on the list? I'll take Vitalik. Vitalik, here we go. Why is that? Yeah. It's just, he's, just a, he's just a genius. Yeah, he's a genius. 
Death? Death and Vitalik, yeah. Vitalik, yeah. Yes, yeah. Poor Nuri Rabini, nobody wants her. That's a poor founding team. <laughs> guys, a big head of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much, guys. You know, we'll bring back our water and I'll say thank, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah.